The 8,974th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is... Letter dated 28th of February 2014 from the Permanent Representative of Ukraine to the United Nations addressed to the President of the Security Council. S-2014-136. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Germany and Ukraine to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. In accordance, I also welcome to this meeting the Sec United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. And in accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's provi Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite um, is Rosemary Di Carlo and the Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to warmly welcome the Secretary General, His Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, and give him the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, Excellencies, I want to reaffirm what I expressed this morning in the meeting of the General Assembly. But of course, it wouldn't make any sense to bother you reading again the same text that I'm sure you are all aware of. In between, during the day, a number of events took place. And uh, with your permission, Mr. President, I would like to ask Ms. Rosemary Di Carlo to be able to brief you on those events. But simultaneously, the day was full of rumors and indications that uh, a, of an offensive against uh, the Ukraine was imminent. In the recent past, there were several situations with similar indications, similar rumors. And I never believed in them, convinced that nothing serious would happen. I was wrong. And I would like not to be wrong again today. So if indeed an operation is being prepared I have only one thing to say from the bottom of my heart. President Putin, stop your troops from attacking the Ukraine. Give peace a chance. Too many people have already died. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Secretary General for his introductory remarks. And I now give the floor to Ms. Rosemary DiCarlo. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier today, the so-called authorities of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics requested military assistance from the Russian Federation. Also today, the Ukrainian authorities declared a nationwide state of emergency and announced other related defense and security measures, including the mobilization of reservists. Throughout the day, we've seen disturbing reports of continued heavy shelling across the contact line and civilian and military casualties. There are also reports of the repeated targeting of civilian infrastructure. This evening, different media are carrying reports of an ongoing large-scale military buildup and on military columns moving towards Ukraine. The Russian Federation has also reportedly shut airspace to civilian aircraft near the border with Ukraine. The United Nations cannot verify any of these reports, but if these developments were confirmed, they would greatly aggravate an already dangerous situation. 
Ukrainian authorities are also reporting a new large-scale cyber attack targeting several state and financial institutions. Mr. President, President Zelensky earlier this evening called for continued diplomacy. Separately, President Putin also spoke about his continued readiness to engage in dialogue. We encourage such efforts even at this late hour. UN staff remain on the ground to provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Ukraine. We are committed to staying and delivering. All parties must ensure their safety and security. Respect for international humanitarian law and international human rights law is also paramount. We cannot predict exactly what will happen in the coming hours and days in Ukraine. What is clear is the unacceptably high cost in human suffering and destruction of an escalation. The people of Ukraine want peace, and I'm certain the people of Russia want peace. We must do everything in our power to ensure that peace prevails. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Ms. DiCarlo for her briefing, and I now give the floor to those council members who wish to make statements. I give the floor first to the representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear colleagues, this is the fourth time the Council is meeting in Ukraine in a matter of weeks. Every time we meet, reality on the ground confirms bit by bit what some of us have been anticipating. Russia has been saying one thing and doing its contrary. We were told troops were retreating when they only have increased. We were told to stop hysteria since troops were in Russian territory. No longer, they are invading a neighbor unprovoked with false pretexts, false narratives, and fabricated news. Every development unfolding in the last 48 hours confirms to us and to the world that Russian worries have nothing to do with, with its security, that its anxieties are not linked to NATO enlargement, that this issue is not a confrontation between Russia and the West. This is a confrontation between Russia and international law, the UN Charter that it deliberately has chosen to ignore, a confrontation between a hegemonistic vision and the rules-based world order. Dear colleagues, it's not about Russia's concern, it's about Russia's appetite. The Ukrainians are facing another aggression just because they dare to exist, because they have chosen to be independent, because they have opted for democracy. Dear colleagues, this is a dark hour, not only for Ukraine, but for the entire international community as we witness with trepidation the progression of a pure act of aggression carefully planned and cold-bloodedly being executed. We called and hoped for a back down of the Russian Federation from this senseless, destructive, and self-destructive action. We repeat the same call for Russia to stop, to reflect, to reverse its illegal decisions, to withdraw from this senseless madness, to de-escalate, not to push towards precipice. Several mechanisms are in place and various proposals have been made, including by President Zelensky, whose calls remain unanswered. Diplomacy is like hope. It dies last. But for it to work, it must be seized, not ignored, as the Secretary General just called for here. We call on the fellow members of the Security Council to rally in support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia has been warned repeatedly that they will be alone in this foolishness, that they will be responsible for the innocent lives lost, including Russians maybe, and for the destruction caused in the heart of Europe in the 21st century. If they choose to continue to execute their plans as everything indicates, they will bear not only the consequences of the war, but also the historical blame and shame of invading a neighboring country when its responsibility as a big country as a permanent member of the Security Council, calls for it to work and help preserve peace and security, not to torpedo it. 
we reiterate our support to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally organized borders and territorial waters. In concluding, I welcome the presence of the permanent representative of Ukraine to this meeting. I would like to convey to him, to the Ukrainian government and people, that at this most critical moment in their history, they are not alone and we stand firm in full solidarity with them for their rights to, free, to be free and choose who they want to be. I thank you. I thank the representative of Albania for his statement and now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Secretary General. Thank you for your strong, strong stance and your powerful remarks today at the General Assembly and for your remarks tonight. Colleagues, a few moments ago, I spoke to President Biden, who asked me to convey in the strongest possible terms his and our steadfast support for Ukraine and support for the urgent meeting this council has convened tonight. Furthermore, he asked me to share that the United States and our allies and partners will continue to respond to Russia's actions with unity, with clarity, and with conviction. We are here tonight because we believe, along with Ukraine, that a full-scale further invasion into Ukraine by Russia is imminent. Tonight, we're seeing the Russians close airspace, move troops into Donbas, and move forces into combat-ready positions. This is a perilous moment, and we're here for one reason and one reason only, to ask Russia to stop, return to your borders, send your troops and your tanks and your planes back to their barracks and hangars, and send your diplomats to the negotiating table. Back away from the brink before it is too late. Last week, the United States informed this council and the world about what we expected to see unfold. We said that Russia would manufacture a pre pretext for an attack. We have since seen numerous false flag events staged along the line of, line of, lines of contact in Donbass. We said Russia would theatrically convene emergency meetings at the highest levels of the Russian government. We all saw this on Monday with the state televised Security Council meeting held by President Putin, an orchestrated moment in which the Russian government decided to recognize as, and I quote, independent states, unquote, sovereign territory of Ukraine controlled by Russia's proxies since 2014. They literally violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity on live television before the world. We said that false proclamations would come declaring Russia would need to defend Russian speakers in Ukraine. We got that and much more from President Putin's speech on Monday and during the speech of the Russian ambassador in the General Assembly today. No one could have predicted just how dangerous, inciting, and far-reaching President Putin's speech would be, with Putin arguing for taking the world back in time to an era of empires and colonies. Finally, we said the attack would come next, that we could expect communications to be jammed, cyber attacks to shut down key Ukrainian institutions. Last week, we attributed to Russia denial of service attacks against Ukrainian banks, and we saw similar activity this morning targeting government sites as well. And in the last few hours, we have received very concerning reports of destructive malware were placed on hundreds of computers and executed on at least some. After that, we said, would come the bombs and missiles, the soldiers and the tanks. Already soldiers have been deployed to the occupied region of Ukraine. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we are here tonight because we believe the rest is imminent. Now, over the past few weeks, Russia has called our predictions hysterical. Russia said we were lying. Russia said we were supplying the world with misinformation. Russia's diplomats even laughed in the face of the human suffering we were sounding the alarm about. But what we said would happen has come to pass for all the world to see. So let us be clear. All parties are not culpable here. There's no middle ground. Calling for both sides to de-escalate only gives Russia a pass. Russia is the aggressor here. Russia's attack on Ukraine is tantamount to an attack on the UN and every member state in the chamber tonight. The Security Council is charged with adjudicating threats to peace and security. Russia is bypassing its entirely, Russia is bypassing it entirely and taking matters into its own hands. And that undermines the institution it undermines everyone who participates in it. The United States, Ukraine, its allies and partners across Europe, UN officials, every other member of this Security Council, we have all repeatedly implored Russia to engage at the diplomatic table. Those calls were not heard. Instead, tonight, Russia has brought its people, the Ukrainian people, and the world to the brink of a conflict that will produce an untold amount of human suffering. I said it in the General Assembly this morning, and I'll say it again tonight. Everyday Russians should be asking themselves right now how many Russian lives Putin will sacrifice for his cynical ambitions. Responsible members of this Security Council will stand together and we will stand with Ukraine. And we will, we will do so despite a reckless, irresponsible, permanent member of the Security Council abusing its powers to attack its neighbor and subvert the UN and our international system. This morning in the General Assembly, we saw dozens of leaders from across the globe stand up to defend the UN Charter and Ukraine against Russia's brazen attacks. We were proud to stand with them. Today I had the opportunity to meet with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba. And many of you were in the General Assembly Hall this morning when Foreign Minister Kaleba received enthusiastic and overwhelming applause after his remarks. Since he could not be here this evening, I would like to conclude by echoing his words. This morning, he warned us all that, quote, no one will be able to sit out this crisis if President Putin decides that he can move forward with this aggression against Ukraine. Your governments and your people will face painful consequences together with our government and our people. Unquote. He is right. History tells us that. And we must confront this threat head on in this council, in the UN, and in our capitals. The people of Ukraine are counting on us. Let's not let them down. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. President, I thank the Secretary General and Under Secretary General Di Carlo for their remarks. We are here tonight to call on Russia to avert war. For months, Russia has been holding a gun to Ukraine's head. Now, President Putin's finger is on the trigger. A full-scale conflict in a country of 44 million people 
will bring immense suffering, casualties on both sides, and devastating humanitarian consequences. The members of this council, the General Assembly, and the Secretary General have all called this week for respect for the principles of the UN Charter. The world is calling for peace, but Russia is not listening. Mr. President, make no mistake, the UK will not compromise. We will not compromise our commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Our support for peace, prosperity, and the democratic freedom of the people of Ukraine. We will not compromise our commitment to the purpose and principles of the UN Charter. Above all, the founding principle of this United Nations, that we live together in peace with one another as good neighbours. Russia's actions are an assault on the Charter. And we will not compromise our commitment to a search for peace. We're here for the second time this week in the Council. My Prime Minister and Foreign and Defence Secretaries have been unsparing in their diplomatic efforts. But we have also announced a significant further sanction step against Russia with our allies, a package targeted against some of the Russian oligarchs, banks and politicians supporting President Putin. And we will ratchet up economic consequences should Russia continue its aggression. There is still time for restraint, reason and de-escalation, but that time is now. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for her statement and I now give the floor to representative of France. Monsieur le Président. President, I thank the Secretary General for his engagement and for his call, which France fully supports. As we speak, Russia is on the verge of provoking chaos in Ukraine and striking an unjustifiable blow to peace and security in the heart of Europe. For several months, the President of the Russian Federation has patiently prepared the means for a major offensive against Ukraine. He has massed soldiers and gathered weapons at an unprecedented level since the end of the Second World War. He has incited violence through lies and disinformation. He has denied even the legitimacy of the Ukrainian state. He has attacked sovereignty and the integrity of Ukraine by recognizing the independence of portions of Ukrainian territory. Faced with this strategy of threats and destabilization, Ukraine has demonstrated admirable restraint. It did not resort to violence despite the Russian provocation. I wish to reiterate our solidarity with the people of Ukraine as President Macron reminded his Ukrainian counterpart a few hours ago. Faced with this strategy of disorder and confrontation, the leaders of Europe and the United States showed their unity and redoubled their efforts to propose an, a diplomatic outcome. President Macron, together with Chan Chancellor Scholz and many partners, have all done their part. They have demonstrated their availability to build with Russia a renewed security architecture for Europe. 
France strongly condemns the strategy of provocation to war of the Russian president. We hear the call of the Ukrainian people, conveyed by President Zelensky in his address to the Russian nation a few hours ago. Ukrainians want peace. They want a relationship of good neighborliness with Russia, mirroring the family and personal relationships which bind to so many Russians and Ukrainians. The international community, Mr. President, has made its voice heard, its united voice, today at the General Assembly. It is that of respect of the Charter of the United Nations, the peaceful settlement of disputes, that of diplomacy. It echoes the clear declarations of the Secretary General. Once again, we call on the Russian Federation to follow this path to draw back on its decision to recognize separatist entities of eastern Ukraine and to call its soldiers back. We call each of the members of this council to act responsibly and to resolutely support all initiatives to prevent and put an end to violations of the Charter of the United Nations. If Russia confirms that its choice is war, it will have to take all of the responsibility and pay the price. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you, Mr. President, and I'd like to thank the Secretary General and Under Secretary General De Carlo for their very sobering remarks at the beginning of our meeting. Mr. President, tonight, as we gather at this table, we are staring into the abyss of a major conflict in Europe, a conflict that would have major global implications. Tonight, the core principles of this United Nations, in which we believe, are under attack. In Ireland, we know the importance of the rules-based international order. We know the importance of respecting the voice and integrity of all countries, big or small. Most fundamentally, we know the value of peace. We believe that one state threatening and using lethal force against another to get its way or to expand its territory is no solution. Ireland has a deep understanding informed by our history that dialogue and respect resolve disputes. Tonight, this drives our solidarity with Ukraine. It is our collective responsibility, indeed our obligation here at this table, to maintain international peace and security, nothing less. That means we stand up for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of every member state of the United Nations. Let's be clear, the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine have not changed. The decision by Russia to recognize as independent entities the non-government controlled areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine does not change those borders one iota. They did not change in 2014, and they have not changed this week. We urge the Russian Federation to reverse this decision immediately. We urge the Russian Federation to refrain from further escalatory unilateral actions, which can only serve to further deepen this crisis. Tonight, the path for diplomacy, the path for dialogue that we have called on for so long is perilously narrow. The principles of the UN Charter we hold dear have already been breached. These principles now risk being further violated. This is the time to show courage, the courage and the time now to pull back from the precipice the time to return to dialogue and to diplomacy. The use of military aggression has no place in our modern world. Have we learned absolutely nothing from our history? 
These United Nations rose from the ashes of two world wars. The senseless destruction of that era was born of a belief that military might makes right. This philosophy, applied with modern weaponry, would unleash devastation and human suffering, affecting millions of innocent people. Tonight, we stand with the people of Ukraine. Tonight, we stand with the UN Charter. We stand with those who, even in this dark hour, still have the courage and hope to bring us back from this precipice. A resort to military conquest for one state to impose its will unilaterally against another, to annex part of its territory, has absolutely no place in the 21st century. There is still a choice, a choice to turn from the path of war to the path of diplomacy and dialogue. Mr. President, it is never too late to make the right choice. Thank you. I thank the representative of Ireland for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking Secretary General for his briefing on the evolving situation in the eastern regions of Ukraine. The Security Council had met two days ago and discussed the situation. We had called for urgent de-escalation of tensions and emphasized on sustained and focused diplomacy to address all issues concerning the situation. However, we note with regret that the calls of the international community to give time to the recent initiatives undertaken by parties to diffuse tensions were not heeded to. The situation is in danger of spiraling into a major crisis. We express our deep concern over the developments which, if not handled carefully, may well undermine the peace and security of the region. We call for immediate de-escalation and for refraining from any further action that could contribute to a worsening of the situation. We call on all parties to exert greater efforts to bridge divergent interests. I would like to underline that the legitimate security interests of all parties should be fully taken into account. India has consistently advocated at the United Nations the need for peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with international law and with agreements entered into by parties concerned. I underline once again that more than 20,000 Indian nationals, including students, are located in different parts of Ukraine, including in its border areas. We are facilitating the return of all Indian nationals, including students, as may be required. We believe that the solution lies in sustained diplomatic dialogue between the concerned parties. In the meantime, we strongly emphasize the vital need for all sides to maintain international peace and security by exercising the utmost restraint. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Sayyid Rais, I would be delighted to thank the Amin Al-Aam and the Chief of Amin Al-Aam for their cooperation. This meeting هو الاجتماع الرابع الذي يعقده مجلس Mr. President, this is the fourth meeting held by the Council on Ukraine in this month. In light of the recent developments, um, in in light of the recent and alarming tensions, my country has taken a firm position calling for de-escalation and efforts to find a peaceful solution to the crisis between the concerned parties. In this context, we would like to point out the following. First, we affirm the importance of engaging in dialogue in good faith while intensifying diplomatic efforts at all levels to support the opportunities of peace on the basis of international law. We reiterate the Minsk agreements still continue, constitute a good basis for reaching a peaceful solution to the crisis and maintaining regional and international security and stability. Second, we stress the importance of adherence to the principles of international law and the Charter of the United Nations. 
particularly in settling international disputes through peaceful means and respecting the sovereignty, independence, territorial integrity of states. Adherence to these principles and compliance with the Charter of the United Nations constitute a central pillar in finding a sustainable and peaceful solution to the current crisis. Third, we reiterate that the crisis in eastern Ukraine could exacerbate the critical conditions of the civilians. Furthermore, there are obstacles to the delivery of humanitarian assistance to some of those in need, even before the recent tensions arise, particularly in the areas near the contact line in eastern Ukraine. Any further escalation could worsen the humanitarian situation for a larger number of civilians. We therefore emphasize the importance of de-escalation and ceasefire. In this regard, we urge all parties not to obstruct the access to humanitarian aid or the movement of civilians in conflict areas in accordance with their obligations under international law. Finally, Mr. President, the UAE reiterates the importance of de-escalation, constructive dialogue, and to continue efforts to reach peaceful solutions consistent with international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates, and I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. President, I thank the Secretary General and U.S. Re. Rosemary de Carlo for their important statement. We are facing the dire prospect of a major war in Europe. Norway strongly condemns the decision by President Putin to send Russian troops into Donetsk and Luhansk regions and the latest announcements of special military operation. These decisions are unjustified, unprovoked, and irresponsible. We call on Russia to reverse these decisions and to immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw all its military forces from the territory of Ukraine and in the vicinity of its internationally recognized borders. Our thoughts are with those who have already suffered too much due to this conflict and with all those who are afraid that tomorrow will be a lot worse. We call upon all parties to strictly respect the relevant provisions of international humanitarian law, which calls on the protection of civilians, including humanitarian personnel and civilian infrastructure, and to facilitate safe, rapid and unhindered humanitarian access to those in need in Ukraine. Like the Secretary General clearly stated, the decision of the Russian Federation to recognize the so-called independent of Donetsk and Luhansk regions are violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and are inconsistent with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Let me recall the principles and purposes of the UN Charter, which are now under threat. The Charter applies to all nations, including Russia. Today in the General Assembly, member states from all over the world strongly urge the parties to pursue negotiation towards a peaceful resolution of the conflict with respect for international law and Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Norway urges Russia, as a party to the Minsk Agreement and to the conflict, to fulfill its commitments to abide by international law and to return to the path of diplomacy. Russia has taken on a clear commitment to seek a peaceful settlement to this conflict and must honor it. We commend Ukraine's posture of restraint in the face of continued provocation and destabilization efforts. President, let me conclude by again reiterating Norway's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its international recognized borders. Thank you. I thank the representative of Norway for her statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of China. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the situation in Ukraine is at a critical juncture. China has been paying close attention to the situation. In the current context, all parties concerned should exercise restraint and avoid the further escalation of tensions. We believe that the door to a peaceful solution to the Ukraine issue is not fully shut, nor should it be. China has pointed out on many occasions that there is a complex historical context on the Ukraine issue and that the current situation is the result of the interplay of many factors. China's position on safeguarding the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states has been consistent. The purposes and principles of the UN Charter should be jointly upheld. We hope that all parties concerned will stay cool-headed and rational and commit themselves to enhance dialogue and consultation to resolve relevant issues properly through negotiations and address each other's legitimate security concerns in line with the principles of the UN Charter. It is especially important at the moment to avoid fueling tensions. China will continue to promote peace talks in its own ways and welcomes and encourages all efforts aimed at a dip diplomatic solution. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for his statement and I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank the Secretary General and the Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for the information and remarks they have put before the Council tonight. Mr. President, the reports received about the movement of troops into certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk in Ukraine are cause for extreme concern. The threat or use of force against the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and political independence of a UN member state is unacceptable. In the present circumstances, the Security Council must act according to its main purpose as holder of the primary responsibility under the United Nations Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. In the exercise of this responsibility, its actions must be geared towards reduction in tensions, towards assisting parties in their negotiations. This is our primary role. The recourse to arms and confrontation cannot lead to lasting peace. In that regard, we call on all parties to exercise maximum restraint and refrain from any action that may further increase tensions on the ground. The time is not for belligerent rhetoric nor for military threats, but to engage truly in a diplomatic process. The means of negotiation have not been exhausted. Immediate de-escalation is of high order. It means, among others, complete and unconditional withdrawal of all military forces as an effective measure for the prevention and removal of threats to peace. Parties must abide by the terms of the Minsk agreements, above all, by its call for a comprehensive ceasefire. The monitoring mission of the OSCE can assist if granted unrestrained access in order to verify, identify, and report accordingly any violation of the ceasefire. Furthermore, the parties must allow the rapid, safe, and unhindered access, unhindered access of humanitarian assistance to those in need. The protection of civilians, including humanitarian personnel and persons in vulnerable situations, must be respected unconditionally. We redouble our calls for the parties to work constructively in all relevant instances, such as the Normandy format and the trilateral contact group. Negotiations must be mindful of the principles of the UN Charter, including sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of its member states. 
negotiations must also, on one hand, take into account the security concerns of all parts of the conflict and, on the other hand, aim to create the adequate conditions for an inclusive political dialogue which must reflect the diversity of and include representation from all peoples of the region. Brazil does not underestimate the complexity of the current situation, but we insist on dialogue as key to achieve a lasting settlement to this conflict. Too much is at stake here, above all the lives of many civilians. We owe them all our efforts to bring this crisis to a peaceful solution. I thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I thank the representative of Brazil for his statement and I give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President. And let me begin by first of all thanking um, the Secretary General and USG Rosemary De Carlo for their significant briefings. Mr. Secretary General, Ghana is grateful to you for your clear statements on the situation in Ukraine in defense of the Charter, the rules-based international order, and our collective security mechanism. The developments that are taking place in Ukraine are indeed troubling. The situation has implications not only for Ukraine and its immediate neighbors, but also for all our countries. Security is indivisible, and the insecurity of one is the insecurity of all. As we indicated in our statement to the Council on Monday night, Ghana deeply regrets the decision of the Russian Federation to naturally recognize the non-government controlled regions of Ukraine and to send troops into those regions. We are also deeply concerned by the implications of those decisions, which suggest that the Russian Federation has turned its back on the Minsk agreements and the path of dialogue required to address any concerns it may have over the implementation of the agreements and related security concerns. We have, however, read in reports this morning the statement attributed to the President of the Russian Federation that his country was always open to diplomacy. We urge that that avowed commitment to diplomacy that the Russian Federation has alluded to should be backed by present actions that de-escalate the situation on the ground and permit an atmosphere for dialogue. We note with concern the risk that an escalation of the situation in Ukraine holds for global peace and security, and stress that those that choose the path of conflict rather than peace bear the consequences of their actions. We are concerned by reports of the commencement of hybrid warfare against Ukraine especially attempts by, of cyber attacks against some of its critical infrastructure. To de-escalate the situation, we urge the Russian Federation to reconsider any intentions to move troops into the eastern regions of Ukraine in response to the purported request by the leaders of the separatist regions for an intervention. Peacekeeping by its nature requires the consent of the parties and the impartiality of the peacekeeping force. The presence of the Russian troops in eastern Ukraine at this time would not fulfill those requirements. If there's a real need, the council should be seized of the matter. We urge for calm and call upon all parties to maintain the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine. We are particularly concerned by the high intensity of violations of the ceasefire in recent days and its consequences on the civilian populations in the Donbass region. We remind all parties of the need to respect international law and international humanitarian law and urge the parties to guarantee unimpeded access for humanitarian assistance in both government and non-government controlled areas. We condemn any military activity that would deliberately target civilians and civilian infrastructure and remind all parties of the personal responsibility that exists in international law. Mr. President, it may be begging the question but nonetheless worth repeating. Ghana unreservedly stands by the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, a bona fide member of the United Nations, whose membership of this organization provides for her guarantees over her internationally recognized borders, the same borders with which she joined this organization. We are aware that the current developments in the eastern regions of Ukraine would not lead to a strategic gain for any party 
and encourage efforts to address both immediate and long-term interests through diplomacy and dialogue. As called for by the preamble of the Charter, we remind all parties to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Finally, we take this opportunity to urge all member states to exercise restraints on the respective unsettled but accepted situations across the globe and to uphold the collective security mechanism established through the Charter of the United Nations. Any differences that exist in international relations must be adjusted by peaceful and legal means. I thank you very much for your kind attention, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Ghana for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Secretary General for his urgent plea for peace and Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo for her briefing. In this grave moment, Kenya continues to call for respect for the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine in line with the core tenets of the United Nations Charter. Kenya is deeply concerned by the rapid escalation of the conflict risks following the recognition of Donetsk and Luhansk as independent states by the Russian Federation and the continued military escalation. We are concerned that there is a serious risk that a conflict enveloping the whole of the Donbas region will occur, present trends holding. Such a development would instantly lead to significant loss of life, a humanitarian crisis, and the large-scale population movement of refugees and internally displaced people. Kenya urgently calls for calm by all parties and their commitment to protecting civilians and civilian objects from any actions contrary to international law and international humanitarian law. We continue to believe that there is still an opportunity for diplomacy to produce a solution to this dangerous crisis. The required diplomatic steps should seek in the short term for a de-escalation of the situation and the limiting of all military maneuvers to prevent sparking a wider conflict. For this to happen, there must also be a stated commitment to negotiations between NATO and the Russian Federation in the middle and long term. Such a commitment will need the vision to design a viable security architecture for Europe that protects the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine and other states while being sensitive to the concerns of all relevant parties. Mr. President, we want to believe that this chamber, in light of its storied past, retains the wisdom and wherewithal to prevent a catastrophic war. We have confidence that the United Nations Charter, embraced as a whole, protects Ukraine and all countries, not only those with modest military means, but also the world's nuclear powers. When we consider the recent past of wars undertaken by choice, and when the charter and international law were breached, eventually the safety and security of all parties was tragically undermined. Mr. President, the membership of this chamber was fundamentally shaped by the states that emerged victorious from World War II. In doing so, the Charter bestowed on them a special responsibility that reflected the sacrifices they had made to defeat a unique evil to mankind. We believe that the leaders who designed today's multilateral system were profoundly humbled by the catastrophic war they had survived, so much so that they were inspired to erect the sovereign equality of states as a central pillar of our United Nations. As such, we urge all members to recall the ruin from war that has been experienced by most states sitting around this table. It is in this moment of peril that we can powerfully pivot to recommit to the charter our predecessors bequeathed us. A large part of that recommitment would be aided by our listening to the Secretary General 
and utilizing his good offices to deliver according to their intended design. In the coming days, we hope that we will observe the escalation in Donbas and that every effort will be made to protect the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of Ukraine. We further hope that we will benefit from the visionary leadership that the world needs today in committing to negotiating a lasting European security architecture that lowers perceptions of threat and promotes cooperation. I thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Thank you, sir. I thank the Secretary General for his statement, as well as Under Secretary General Di Carlo for the information she provided. Sir, this is the fourth time in three weeks that this Council is meeting to discuss the situation in Ukraine. We are meeting this evening, 48 hours after our latest meeting on the subject, because the territorial integrity and the national uh, sovereignty of Ukraine have been attacked. We are meeting this evening because men, women uh, and children are caught in murderous violence in eastern Ukraine, uh, leading to a massive exodus uh, which imperils their dignity and safety. We meet this evening because, once again, the specter of a war with, re with redoubtable consequences hangs over an entire region and because we fear an imminent invasion of Ukraine. We see an attack on the fundamental principles of the Charter of the United Nations, and we must go further and ensure that all of the provisions of the Charter are respected and that the international community focus with the same commitment, with the same ardor on the need for preserving peace and security. The decision of Russia uh, to recognize the independence of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, sidelines uh, the relevance and the importance of the Minsk agreements, and it heightens an imminent uh, military attack on Ukraine. My country is, uh, remains attached uh, to the territorial integrity and sovereignty of every state. The strict respect uh, of these principles for the African Union is the basis of our social contract as members of the international community. We are persuaded that intense diplomatic activity in of recent weeks will lead to the prevalence of the logic of dialogue over that of confrontation and will contribute to avoiding the irreparable. Eight years ago, Mr. President, in a context similar to that which brings us together today, two member states of, uh, the, of the General Assembly abstained while the same fundamental principles of the Charter of the United Nations that bring us together today were violated. This refusal to align themselves not very long ago translates a, a lack of understanding, perhaps, a, of the international community, of the persistence of zones of influence, which we thought had been overcome after the end of colonization. Unfortunately, this terrible reality re uh, remains in several regions of the world, in Asia and Africa, and today in Europe once again. This Council must guarantee the fundamental principles of the Charter. It must in ensure the respect of national sovereignty and territorial integrity. We call for an immediate ceasefire and de-escalation, as well as a sense of responsibility 
by giving by giving priority to the peaceful settlement of conflicts in accordance with the charter and we call for protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure and refraining from any action that could create an obstacle for the provision of humanitarian assistance to the population so, who so sorely need it. I wish to conclude by reiterating my country's uh, attachment uh, to a rules-based uh, international order, one which is based on the rule of law, not on uh, the law that the strongest will prevail. Thank you very much, sir. I thank the representative of Gabon for his statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My country is grateful for the presence and the call of the Secretary General uh, in this chamber, and we thank him for being here. We also thank uh, Ms. Carlo for her briefing. Mexico deplores the fact that despite widespread, uh, widespread calls from the international community, tensions around Ukraine, instead of having decreased, have increased. For this reason, we see ourselves uh, obliged to meet once again in this chamber. We all, as member states, having ratified the Charter of the United Nations, committed ourselves to respecting the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of states. We, members of the Security Council, have the first responsibility for the maintenance of peace and international security. This creates the obligation to guarantee that the Security Council can perform its mandate and ensure the respect for the Charter of the United Nations. Mexico supports all of the Secretary General's statements and calls on parties to avail themselves of the good offices which the Secretary General has offered. The President of Mexico declared just this morning that we will not accept the invasion of one country by another since it is against international law. We recall once again that Russia, a few days ago, in this very chamber, before the international community, made an emphatic declaration that it would not invade Ukraine. Uh, the sending of a special mission runs counter to this statement. If there were an invasion, this would be an act of aggression in accordance with Resolution 3314 of the General Assembly. We will not waver in our call for detente, diplomacy, and dialogue. A diplomatic solution is the only way of drawing away from the precipice, which would be a war in Europe. Thank you very much, sir. I thank the representative of Mexico for her statement, and I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of the Russian Federation. Colleagues, today we've had an intensive day from the point of view of discussions of the Ukrainian crisis. I won't repeat what I said this morning at the General Assembly. I can only state with regret that taking stock of the day as signals to Kiev about the need to stop provocations against Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics were not heeded. It would appear that our Ukrainian colleagues, who recently have been actively armed and egged on by a host of states, are still harbouring the illusion that, with the benediction, benediction of their Western sponsors, they will be able to achieve a military solution to the problem in the Donbass. Otherwise, it is difficult to explain the substantial intensification of shelling and acts of diversion on the territory of these re republics. The special monitoring mission of the OCE recorded today almost 2,000 cases of violations of the ceasefire regime, including almost 1,500 explosions. Those living in Donetsk and Lugansk still sheltering in basements. The re uh, refugees are still flowing into Russia. In a word, the nature of the Uk provocation by the Ukrainian military has not changed. You don't want to notice this, repeating the Ukrainian fairy tales that those living in Donetsk are all but shelling themselves. It is no surprise that the increasing suffering of those living in the Donbass does not seem to affect our Western colleagues. Through the whole day of debate today at the General Assembly, you haven't been able to find one word of compassion or condolences. It is as if these four million people for you simply don't exist. How would like to recall that the principle of sovereignty and territorial equality of states 
and territorial integrity of states, in violation of which uh, we are being accused of violating in Ukraine today. According to the Declaration on the Principles of International Law pertaining to friendly relations between peoples adopted in 1970, they should be fully complied with as regards states who, and I quote, conduct themselves in compliance with the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and thus possessed of a government representing the, with a, with a, the whole people without distinction of race, creed or colour, the whole people living in that territory, end of quote. Today's government in Ukraine simply is not that. And the tragedy in Ukraine started indeed after the illegal ma coup in Maidan in 2014, when rather than dialogue with the Russian-speaking citizens of Ukraine, the new authorities brandished guns and airplanes at them. Information and testimony to this end is more than sufficient. However, our Western colleagues pr prefer not to notice this. We tried yesterday and today, yesterday before yesterday, to extend explain to you the logic of the decision made by Russia to recognize the LPR and DPR. And we focused on the need to ensure peace and security there. However, you don't want, didn't want to hear, from, hear this and you don't want to hear it now. For you, those living in the Donbass are simply pawns in a geopolitical game focused on weakening Russia and promoting the uh, blocker from NATO to its borders. For us, these people are women, children, the elderly, who for eight years have been cowering from Ukraine's shelling and provocations. For us, these are Ukraine people and not the Maidan authorities. In this, this is the difference in our approaches. If you do not change the geopolitical lens, you will never understand us. Then, on, on those on whose behalf this decision I mentioned was made, and who didn't, who you've not even thought about for over these eight years, simply calling them pro-Russian separatists and terrorists. Those people are the most important for us. I'd like to say once again that the root of today's crisis around Ukraine is the actions of Ukraine itself, who for many years were sabotaging its obligations under the Minsk package of measures. Last week, even, there was a hope that Kiev would rethink and nevertheless implement what it signed up to do in 2015. For this, first and foremost, they needed direct dialogue with Donetsk and Lugansk. However, further confirmation that Ukraine is not ready for this type of dialogue and steps to grant Donbass special status as set forth in the Minsk agreements, while us, with the support of this position from Western backers, finally convinced us that we simply cannot force those living in the Donbass to suffer more. And as much as I already said, the Ukrainian provocation against the, those in Donbass not only has not stopped, but has intensified, the leaders of the LPR and the DPR turned to us with a request to provide military support in line with bilateral uh, cooperation agreements as a, a, agreed at the same time as they were recognition. This is a logical step, which is a consequence of the actions of the Ukrainian regime. During this meeting, the president of Russia Putin spoke with uh, and said that he made a decision for a special military operation in the Donbass. We don't know all the details today, but briefly I would like to inform you that from his uh, statement it says that the occupation of Ukraine uh, is not in our plans. The aim of this special operation is to protect the people who for over eight years have been suffering genocide, genocide from the Kiev regime and for this we will de aim to demilitarize and degenocide in Ukraine and also support those uh, and, and hold accountable those who carried out so many crimes against civilians including the including citizens of the Russian Federation. This decision was made in line with Article 51 of the UN Charter and, and the sanction of the Russian Federation and fulfilling uh, the agreement on and recognition of the LPR and DPR. We're receiving a lot of information and we will analyse this and we will keep you up to speed with this. Now I resume my function as President of the Council and I give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Well, distinguished members of the Security Council, 
Secretary General, Under Secretary. Before I try to deliver parts of the statement that I came here with tonight, most of it is already useless since uh, 10 p.m. New York time. I would like to cite Article 4 of the UN Charter. And it says, membership in the United Nations is open to all other peace-loving states which accept the obligations contained in the present charter and in the judgment of the organization are able and willing to carry out these obligations. Russia is not able to carry out any of the obligations. The ambassador of the Russian Federation three minutes ago confirmed that his president declared a war on my country. So before I read parts of my statement, I would like to avail of the presence of the Secretary General and request the Secretary General to distribute among the members of the Security Council and the members of the General Assembly the legal memos by the Legal Council of the United Nations dated December 1991, and in particular, the legal memo dated 19th of December 1991 the one that we've been trying to get out of the Secretariat for a very long time and we were denied to get it. The Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Charter reads, the admission of any such state to membership in the United Nations will be affected by a decision of the General Assembly upon the recommendation of the Security Council. Mr. Secretary General, please instruct the Secretariat to distribute among the members of the Security Council and the members of the General Assembly a decision by the Security Council dated December 1991 that recommends that the Russian Federation can be a member of this organization as well as a decision by the General Assembly dated December 1991, where General Assembly welcomes the Russian Federation to this organization. It would be a miracle if the Secretariat is able to produce such decisions. There is nothing in the Charter of the United Nations about continuity as a sneaky way to get into the organization. So when I was coming here an hour ago or so, I was intending to ask the Russian ambassador to confirm on the record that the Russian troops will not start firing at Ukrainians today and go ahead with the offensive. It became useless 48 minutes ago. Because about 48 minutes ago, your president declared the war on Ukraine. So now I would like to ask the ambassador of the Russian Federation to say on the record that at this very moment, your troops do not shell and bomb Ukrainian cities. That your troops do not move in the territory of Ukraine. You have a smartphone, you can call Lavrov right now. We can make a pause to let you go out and call him. If you are not in a position to give an affirmative answer the Russian Federation ought to relinquish responsibilities 
of the President of the Security Council, pass these responsibilities on to a legitimate member of the Security Council, a member that is respectful of the Charter, and I ask the members of Security Council to convene an emergency meeting immediately and consider all necessary draft decisions to stop the war. Because it's too late, my dear colleagues, to speak about de-escalation, too late. The Russian president declared the war on the record. Should I play the video of your president? Ambassador, shall I do that right now? Or you can confirm it. Do not interrupt me, please. Thank you. Then don't ask me questions when you are speaking. Proceed with your, proceed with your statement. Anyway, you declare the war. It is the responsibility of this body to stop the war. So I call on every one of you to do everything possible to stop the war. Or should I play the video with your president declaring the war? Thank you very much. Again, I must say that I thank the representative of Ukraine for his statement and the questions I wasn't planning to answer them because I've already said all I know at this point. Waking up Ms. Minister Lavrov at this time is not something I plan to do. You said the information that we have will be something we provide. And this isn't called a war, this is called a special military operation in the Donbass. I now give the floor to the representative of Germany. Mr. President, we meet at the very moment of a military escalation we have not experienced in Europe for over a generation's time. The president of the Russian Federation announced a military operation on Ukrainian territory. We condemn this in the strongest possible terms. And we call upon all members of the Security Council and the United Nations to now stand up for Ukraine and again against a shameless breach of international law. Two days ago, Russia's decision to recognize the self-proclaimed so-called People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk was harshly rejected in this council. It had already dealt a devastating blow to the principles and the international order that the United Nations stand for. Russia has not listened, and it turns out it was not prepared to listen. It has continued its massive military buildup, and we observed and observe cyber attacks directed against Ukraine, and now Russian military is moving into Ukrainian territory. By the actions and this unprovoked uh, military operation, Russia is violating the core principles of the UN Charter. We condemn the use of force against innocent people and the violation of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. We urge Russia to terminate its military action against Ukraine immediately and withdraw its troops. Mr. President, our thoughts are with the Ukrainian people. We will be steadfast in our support for Ukraine and our support for the UN Charter. The Russian aggression will come at an unprecedented price politically, economically, and morally. Mr. President, France, Ukraine, and my country stood ready for diplomacy, for another meeting in the Normandy format, or for the summit that Ukraine had proposed. With our allies and partners, we called on Russia to seek a diplomatic way forward in vain. Now is the moment to speak up and defend the international order of the UN Charter against unilateral aggression jointly and decisively. Tonight we stand with Ukraine and we are doing so unwavering and determined. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Germany for her statement. And now I give the floor to the United States who wish to, ask, to make a further statement. Thank you. In my remarks tonight, I said that we predicted Russia's false flag attacks, the misinformation, the theatrical emergency meetings and the cyber attacks. But one piece had not come to pass. 
Unfortunately, while we've been meeting in the Security Council tonight, it appears that President Putin has ordered that last step. At the exact time as we are gathered in the Council seeking peace, Putin delivered a message of war in total disdain for the responsibility of this, this Council. This is a grave emergency. The Council will need to act, and we will put a resolution on the table tomorrow. As President Biden said tonight, Russia alone is responsible for the death and destruction this attack will bring, and the United States and our allies and partners will respond in a united and decisive way. The world will hold Russia accountable. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States uh, for her statement. I now like to give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom who asked to make a further statement. Oh, thank you. As we sat in, as we sat in this chamber urging Russia to step back, President Putin announced special military operations on Ukrainian territory. This is unprovoked and unjustified. This is a grave day for Ukraine and for the principles of the United Nations. We and our partners have been clear that there will be consequences for Russia's actions. We fully support the United States call for a UN Security Council resolution. This council must do all it can to stop the war and uphold the Charter. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom. And now I'll give the floor to the representative of Albania, who also wished to make a further statement. Dear colleagues, we could not end this meeting that what we had feared and anticipated since days is happening. Explosions are reported in Kiev and in several other cities in Ukraine. Masks are finally down and tanks are in. As we speak, Russia is implementing its plan and attacking a neighbor to whom it has decided to deny existence, freedom, the land, dignity, and life. We call on all the members of the United Nations to rally in support of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, to stand with Ukraine and its people, to condemn firmly and unequivocally this aggression, to stand for peace, for rules, for international law, and take whatever measures they deem necessary to show the aggressor that its actions will bear consequences. Let me reiterate, Russia will be held responsible for the consequences of an unprovoked war, for the loss of human rights, for causing unbearable human pain and for opting for destruction when we need development, for bringing death where we aspire for need and for hope, for choosing to become an outlaw when we need cooperation. Russia will bear historical blame and shame and the consequences of invading a neighboring country and attempting to destroy European security. Let's unite and make sure it will not succeed. Thank you. I thank the representative of Albania, and I now give the floor to the representative of France for a further statement. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, at the time when we were in an emergency meeting to try to prevent the worst and from war breaking out, we learned uh, we all learned that the President of the Russian Federation had coordinated a special military operation in Donbass, and that Russia will do its utmost to demilitarize Ukraine. Russia has therefore chosen war. France condemns, in the strongest possible terms, the initiation of these operations. This decision announced at the very moment when the Council was meeting shows the disdain which, that Russia has for international law and for the United Nations. Russia must be accountable to the Security Council. For this reason, 
France will join its partners in this council and in the hours to come will prepare a resolution condemning the war conducted by Russia. We call on all members of this council to support us. Under these tragic circumstances, we call on the Russian Federation to respect international humanitarian law, no matter what the circumstances. We call for the protection and respect of all civilians, including uh, particularly vulnerable persons, women, children, and humanitarian personnel. Thank you, sir. I thank the representative of France, and I give the floor now to the representative of Ireland to make a further statement. Thank you, Mr. President. When I spoke earlier, I said that the path for diplomacy and the path for dialogue was perilously narrow, and I didn't realize, in fact, how narrow and indeed how close to the precipice we really were just over an hour ago. We now see that that path has been closed by the announcement of a military aggression on the part of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. That is something that we roundly condemn. We stand with the people of Ukraine tonight, with every man, woman and child who is seeing this news as we did, as we sat here in the chamber and whose lives are at risk. We believe it is now time indeed for this council to stand up and assume its responsibility and to speak out in the strongest possible terms about this act of aggression. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. I thank the representative of Ireland and I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine to make a further statement. Well, as I said, relinquish your duties as a chair. Call Putin, call Lavrov to stop aggression. And I welcome the decision of some members of this council to meet as soon as possible to consider the necessary decision that would condemn the aggression that you launch on my people. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell, Ambassador. I wanted to say in conclusion that we aren't being aggressive against the Ukrainian people, but against the junta that is in power in Kiev. There are no more speakers on the list. This meeting is adjourned.